great speaker. I would like to uh, mention the uh, the the first one is Professor Sri Ediswasono. Sri Edi Sasona is the president of Taman Siswa. I like to Taman Siswa, professor of economics, University of Indonesia. And the second speaker is Jin Chian Tsai from Taiwan University. Uh, we have a session until until 12:30. We start now, and this professor. Sri Edi Swasono first. The faster the better. That is uh, your the time. And we will after that uh, discussion. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for being invited here. Uh, my student over there, Professor Lukman, <laughs> when he was caught by the old regime, I was the one who take him to the prison. A political prison, not crime, of course. He was a young student at that time. You know, he's already a professor, sitting together with me here. Before I start, may I give you a present, page 9 of my paper, please. It's a real present. Even the Indonesian, sometimes they do not realize how many ethnics they have in Indonesia. Now you have a complete ethnic. Of course, this is the major ethnic. The major ethnic. Starting from Bali, until Timor. No, so let's get acquainted with Indonesia, knowing so many ethnic groups in our country. Once, when I was in the University of Gajamada, right in front of me were so many professors. And I said, who can mention 20 ethnic groups in one minute? I give my inflow to you. Of course, an inflow contains of something. No one can do that. But every day they said, Bineka Tugal Ika. It's only in the lips. But actually, they do not understand how diverse we are. And who are they? Now, you have it complete. At my university, there is no such thing called the economy of Gotong Royong. This terminology was just raised by him. So I try to to design something which might be what he wants. Economy of Gotong Royong. As follows. May I start with what a Nobel, Nobel laureate Amartya Sen said. The nature of economics has been substantially impoverished by the distance that has grown between economics and ethics. He's a Nobel laureate in economics, and he said that in 1987. As you see, Indonesia is an archipelago stretching from Sabang in the west to Merauke in the east, from Yangas Island in the north to Rote Island in the south, which is approximately the distance between London and Moscow and between Moscow and Egypt. So it's a very huge, very large country. The Indonesian people do not form a homogenous group. 
but heterogeneous. As they consist of hundreds of ethnic groups, you can see in the Ambedix one, it is the reason why, it is the reason that unity of Indonesia depicted in the dictum of Binega Tugalika, which means unity in diversity. Binega Tugalika has then become a national symbol of the state, the logo of which is the Garuda Pancasila. The question is how? How can diversity become a unity? Since independence in 1945, Indonesia has stipulated Pancasila, which contained five basic principles of the Republic of Indonesia. One, believe in God. Second, humanity. Three, nationalism. Four, democracy. And five, social justice. This is a nation's common denominator, or nation's mutual soul, which means that Pancasila transforms. Again, means Pancasila transforms diversity into unity. So we should have a common denominator for the diversity. We are different, but we have a common soul, and the soul is Pancasila. We cannot get away from that. As the Indonesia Constitution emphatically explained the Indonesian national economic system, it has adopted the doctrine of economic mutualism and brotherhood, which explicitly reject capitalism and its sibling liberalism. To debunk this economic constitutionalism, I like to quote three articles from Indonesia's constitution as follows. I don't need to read one. Let me read the number two. Article 33 of the Indonesia's 1945 Constitution, the piece of economic democracy. The economy is to be constructed. The economy is to be designed. The economy is structured as a mutual endeavor based upon the principle of brotherhood. And then Article 34, the poor, destitute children shall be cared for by the state. This is the state's responsibility to care of the people. I would like to emphasize further that Indonesia's economic system, according to the Constitution, does neither go to the left nor does it go to the right, or between left or right but it has definitely its own direction. By referring to Anthony Giddens books, The Third Way, we can affirm that Indonesia has its own third way with Dr. Muhammad Hatta, who proclaimed Indonesia independence and who was the architect of the three articles above called to be the straight way or the Pancasila way, where the moral values of humanity and social justice are embedded in substantially. What does the straight way or Pancasila way mean? It does mean that social justice is the social right of the people. That the social welfare is not a philanthropic altruism, but it is the people's social right. That the government should honor as well as provide substantial prime attention to societal welfare, not social welfare, societal welfare. We believe in the people's sovereignty, not in the market sovereignty. Our overnational strategy then should accordingly be people-based or people-centered strategy. The market should conform with the basic development strategy. We realize that the government of Indonesia has not yet been able to meet the above mentioned state responsibility. The people have not been able to be protected from widespread poverty and unemployment. The people are not been living in peace and suffering from painful feeling of social jealousy caused by the increasing gap 
between the rich and the poor, which 20 years ago showed a Gini ratio at the rate of 0.32, and now has grown worse, become 4.042, even though the economy has grown at the rate of 6%. The intellectual responsibility of academicians are now being questioned why they neglect fully a law in Indonesia which is blessed with rich natural resources to have a high rate of poverty. The Indonesian economic system is based upon cooperativism, upholding the tradition of mutual help, which we call here Gotong Royal, which means promoting mutual empowerment. The reformation era of the present past, of the present past seemingly has failed Reformation has become deformation. The national economy has been deformed by the fast intruding capitalistic business venture, creating mysteries in the local grassroots economy. New reformation is being called for now. We have to intensify making use of the natural riches and in the same time preserve or if possible renew them. We are embarking on the new economic development strategy, encouraging grassroots business venture to catch up on with, with what we lack behind in the past, to raise for optimal national economic growth, redistribution, and prosperity. We are pro proactively trying to reform the unjust globalization through the international fora like TWA, TWO, APEC, Asian, Common Market, etc., putting an end to unfair free market and the brutal competition of liberalistic laissez-faire. Some notes on Asian Common Market. This is an example. We wish that the Asian Common Market would truly become a forum of economic cooperation representing the original soul of ASEAN instead of promoting economic competition which should be able to provide mutual economic complementarities and a win-win endeavor and enhance mutual prosperity among the participants. Sometimes I wonder why APEC, Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation in practice become Asia-Pacific economic competition. Even my president once speak up in the APEC meeting in Beijing, he said economic competition. I don't know who writes, who wrote the, the speech, but it was a, a real mistake. Economic cooperation. They are only desirable, there is only one desirable choice in intensifying collaboration with the friendly nation. I like to note here that the chairman of the steering committee of this joint conference requests me to say something about what he calls the economy Gotong Royong. <laughs> there is nothing like that at the university, but, but I try to write something what you mean with economic Gotong Royong. But actually, there is nothing like that in the university. Okay, I may, I may say the following. The economic Gotong Royong is the economy that based upon the principle of economic democracy, promoting people's economic participation and emancipation, where the people are mutually cooperating, helping each other, and mutually empowering. The mutual interest should be the soul of Gotong Royong. The mutual interest should be the soul of Gotong Royong. We keep away from free market competition that upholds self-interesting doctrine, self-interest doctrine of the individualism, which will cause the weak to be disempowered and impoverished. Market sovereignty, free market competition, effect the poor, but it does not effect poverty. 
like you see also in Jakarta and in Indonesia, in Jogja, even you see in Jogja. Development has affecting the poor, but not affecting poverty. This is where the Gotong Royong is lacking, but that will happen. Let me quote the following free market dilemma. This is from well known economist, of course. The market is not a sea to servant. It's not a sea to servant of the wealthy, but indifferent servant of the poor. Market system promote a morality. It is not just an economic failure, but it is a moral failure. Competition is to be softened. It must be softened or reduced into concur, concur, or concourse, must be reduced into race, or it must be reduced into contest. Competition then becomes cooperation. There's a misspell here. Cooperation, meaningful for both sides, mutually complementary, mutually synergizing to form a non zero sum cooperation producing win-win solution. This is it, Mr. Chairman. This I can say. The World War I was widely claimed by many to be a war with a sole intention of putting stop the ongoing war during the time. A war to end wars. When the World War I ended, it seems that the world had halted from moving. The League of Nations has to be created with, this, if it's, if it's, with the purpose of maintaining peace and putting the world back on its feet. However, the League of Nations failed to keep up with its expectation. Eventually, the world once again became embroiled in the Second World War. After the World War II, the United Nations was established and continues to be a successful world organized organization till today. Despite the fact that today conflicts and wars continues to exist, it must be acknowledged that the United Nations is able to maintain world peace, thus preventing the occurrence of another world war. People today, even since the World War I, are very war. Nations have since long opted to embark on cause that forever bring peace by the way of negotiations, cooperations, alliance among themselves. This is evident through the existence of various movements, political and trade pact, cooperation activities such as the Red Cross, the Non-Aligned Movement, a forum known as not to an armed race but to a peace race, Nuclear disarmament, disarmament, OECD, AFTA, NAFTA, TWO, APEC, ASEAN, ASEAN Economic Community, UNICEF, UNESCO, etc., etc. You can mention plenty of them. Only a few days after, uh, oh, this is not war. Only a few days after the fall of Berlin War. The Berlin Wall. After the fall of the Berlin Wall, Leonard Bernstein conducted a gala concert in Berlin that was no longer divided. On the program was Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. The final chorus affirmed the Brethren of Men, the other mentioned Werden Bruder of Johann Christoph von Schiller. Then Europe countries peacefully united into European nation. The noble culture of peace has become the ethical global values based upon the defined claim of humanity. Let us have an intermezzo. We ought to learn from the wisdom of cooperation or Gotong Royong of the Star Trek, you know, by Eugene Rondon Duery, in which Dr. Smith, Dr. Smith, the Robert Man, the Robot Man, made his following gracious address. Reading, I'm pleased to see that we are different. 
may we together become greater than the sum of us. So this is the meaning of mutualism and the meaning of cooperation. When we are together, then we become greater than the sum of us. To maintain unity in diversity of our national cohesion, we need to strengthen cooperation and intensify the Kotong Royong. The culture of Kotong Royong in Indonesia is local wisdom. The culture of Kotong Royong is Indonesia's local wisdom that I believe may inspire global solution. So the world actually is not fatigued with wars, with conflicts, and with fatigue of everything. And finally, the wish to cooperate. And the new ethics in economics is the ethic of mutual prosperity of the world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Sidi Adi Sasana. And I invite Professor Dujian Sai from Taipei Medical University. Please, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I just learned very difficult Indonesian term. Learn from Chair. And I think that the Professor Sri Adi Sasana and the user term, Gong Tong Long Yang. I just find that the pronunciation in Mandarin, the meaning is exactly the same as what you mean in Indonesia. So I think that uh, in Asia we already share a common, kind of common culture and a common economic region, right? <laughs> okay, so today uh, I'm going to uh, uh, focus upon how we try to enact bioethics soon. Uh, the idea of civil economy and uh, health technology. So I think that, um, which is definitely for transcultural justice. And as always, uh, I'm just told. So my team member work. So uh, what I say is their uh, great accomplishment. And uh, here is my uh, brief speech outline. First, I would like to introduce you uh, what is the Pindong Christian Hospital. And uh, I think that uh, our hospital has five very unique features. And uh, the first is that we provide um, beautiful services for uh, community health. And secondly, we establish uh, leadership in big data and uh, precision medicine. And how we do that? Later. And we have a small hospital with uh, uh, um, IOL, IOT uh, line, uh, it's, uh, it's line of things uh, for sharing decision, it's mainly for sharing decision making. So in the sense that the IOT, we pro provide a kind of uh, envi friendly environment to help people get information to ensure the autonomy. And also, uh, we ensure the tourist safety uh, with the medical tourism competence, which is the, uh, the function of our hospital in the region. And also, you can see that we already uh, disseminated the kind of idea into some place in China. And also, uh, we wish that uh, we can facilitate mutual learning in history and also for the future. Uh, like here, I, was, I think that we should, since we have a common world, common economic vision, so and so as well. So I think that uh, we should try to pursue 共同荣耀, right? And and also our hospital support uh, two very important workshops. Uh, this one is with Kaifeng Psychiatry Center. Uh, we just finished this year. And uh, for the next week, we will have a, a workshop on cancer treatment and 
hospice care, clinical care, as well as uh, bioethics. Some of our friends already attend the workshop. So I think that um, the question I pose is, I'm sorry, my poor. Um, yes, let's go downstairs. Yeah, and the question uh, we pose is that facing the challenge of the national health insurance system and the commercialization of health care, efforts to cope with medical professionalism, those far leave much to be desired. So, what we are facing now? There are global issues and the local issues. Uh, the global issues are increasing dependence on market force, which our physicians feel frustrated. And also, there's rising cost from technological innovation as well, and the management override physician's autonomy, and their traditional commitment to privacy of patients' interests will be their major concern. And there are also local issues, like the national health interests. It's become a peculiar mix of governmental interventionism and the market ideology. And the patient's lack of risk-sharing awareness is one of our major problems, and the physician's <coughs> collective integrity yet to be established. So, we propose a theory. Our research team advocates by asking the reflection on professionalism for achieving transcultural justice and for using smart health technology in an attempt to replace the market economy with the civil economy in the healthcare arena. So, uh, Byron, you must feel familiar. <laughs> okay, and I think that uh, why we focus on medicine? Because according to uh, Professor Asa Kremen, the art of medicine is all about how we endure together in various clinical and social contexts. And uh, I quote uh, Byron Major and their great research team. Uh, in their article, medical humanitarianism is a rapidly changing field which actively engage in debates regarding ethics of intervention, program effectiveness, and the relevance of the social science research to the field. So, uh, there are three main theoretical questions I want to ask. Well, what's the meaning of recent uh, economic crisis? I think that at the very beginning, which, is, which was happened in Southeast Asia, and then, uh, at that time, we tried to solve the problem with the four big countries. And uh, later on, there is a problem uh, in the United States and uh, in Europe. Then, I think that uh, at that time, the world economy, world economy has a one-China policy. Think about the development of China will be able to save the capitalism, even if it's in crisis. Uh, is that the meaning of the recent uh, economic crisis. And the secondary, from the ancient time to the genomic uh, breakthrough, uh, are we really on the way toward freedom? And look at the most recent bar technology uh, breakthrough. Are we in the, the rise of information society? Are we in the mode of production change? Or just it's a, it's a kind of uh, continuous process in our economic development? What are we now? So I'm thinking that probably in between, uh, if our identity should be assumed uh, in essential this way, or to be put in a very extremely relative way, which is what Michel Foucault said, the main interest in life and work is to become someone else that you were not in the beginning. So it's nothing essential at all. Then, uh, 
I would prefer to summarize, summarize in between. The principles of justice are chosen behind a veil of ignorance. But at the same time, I think that John Rawls pay great attention to the ingredients in his institutional foundation of theory of justice. In such a way, I think that there is a way probably, in some sense, the pre uh, exist uh, preceding essence may come about in the process of, in the process of searching principles principle of justice for a just society. So, uh, in critical setting, I would like to go back to whatever Johnson's approach. For I, beginning with the medical indication, the doctor-patient relationship, the medical contract is a bit one step ahead beyond the social contract, which is in more or less related terms. So in that sense, I think that as part of the Asian culture, we try to follow a kind of doctrine of means, which uh, in the other world, on the other world, uh, we are trying to find a balance between uh, various kinds of oppositional binary extremes. But we think that uh, even those different ideas, they could be related together like in mental health sphere institutionalization and the deinstitutionalization, community and the institution might be not be binary to each other. So in that sense, we are thinking our technology should be used to facilitate, to enhance the human relations. In that sense, uh, I take the Asian uh, past words, he thinks that uh, he defined civil economy as follows. Humans are more relational. Give exchanging animals who are naturally disposed to cover, cooperate for mutual benefit. This one, Gongtong uh, Yang, I think that it is one to replace the modern economy, which assumes that the human beings are fundamentally self interest So, with the, with the kind of theoretical lens, uh, we have adapted, adopted a service-oriented participatory action research as a methodology for institutional-based community empowerment personnel training that adapts technological innovation to the developing country as well as remote tribal areas. So we think that we are just follow a large uh, intellectual discourse since the 1960s when uh, knowledge is power. This slogan has been replaced by knowledge is sharing and the power is participation. And also we are thinking that a practice-based bioethics, uh, which is a kind of humanistic ways of humanistic knowledge management along the line, clinical ethics will be a and the research ethic will be a foundation of professional ethic and the looking for sustainable ethic by mixing social and the medical context together. Along the line, we are thinking that this is the way of focus upon value-based clinical ethic committee and its function now all medical institution become a learning environment on itself. And we now propose a paradigm shift. Research in the past is a researcher's business. Now we call for a patient-centered outcome research. Patient become a partner, maybe an initiator of research agenda. So then, why technology matter? The story happened in Malawi and in the tribal area, remote tribal area in Taiwan. That we use the technology that people uh, get better off, uh, the AIDS uh, were controlled, and the, the tribal area, in the past without hope, now get their own innovative momentum. How could we do that? Um, first, we provide service first, and then technology is to help us expand, disseminate our services. So it's low cost, and each side, 
we use a small heart concept. And then if effectively in patient tracing, thing, because there's even no ID card in Malawi, and we avoid the case duplication. So in this way, we provide a self-sufficient maintainer system for Malawi. And for the tribal area in Taiwan, we learn what from Malawi, and then we use the same technique applied in the tribal area. But far more advanced is that we create a kind of community cloud in the sense that the data and the uh, supporting system is arranged and running by community themselves. So along the line, we have a different kind of supporting system. First, uh, we have a, a hospital cloud to support the community is over here. And also the community network will extend home care uh, to each family in need by the community network. So community uh, participant within the community can also earn the money by the kind of network. In the past, which is impossible. So now, with the kind of experience, we begin to build a new friendship and a new model established uh, with our partner hospital in Benin, Hong Kong Hospital. And here, we provide a kind of joint clinical services. While we are doing joint clinical services, we want to harmonize the level, the quality level of our clinical services uh, to the uh, international standard. To ensure that we, the technology, serve as a very important way. First, they help us to develop a contextualized base of hospital management. And they use a way to uh, implement the IT infrastructure, which is affordable at the same time, from one department to the other department. And then once the service volume and the quality has been scaled, it's become much more affordable and can further invest even for mental hospital. This is for general hospital. So uh, we think that a guiding principle for transcultural practice is that we want to nurture a civil economy characterized by transcultural justice, which means that whenever we go, we always respect the autonomy, the leadership of the local people. And then, why we think the leadership of local people is important, even we see the patient. I think that the most fundamental level in doctor-patient relationship is the demand and ability of the patient and their community. So the first layer is to develop a supporting network and the community autonomy. And then 80% of disease will be recovered by themselves. Most of the time, doctor just provide comfort for the patient. So we think that professional is more important to play an important role. If anything can be treated by medicine, then just use IT, let the lay person to deliver the medicine. I think that the professional should be the teacher, should be a facilitator rather than a medicine giver. And afterward, I think that the hospital management step and the IT step should be at a higher level to empower the way physicians empower the patient. So in that sense, we think that the electronic medical record and the hospital management system is to ensure the patient's autonomy. And afterward, we are thinking that uh, based upon the idea, sorry, I reversed the two slides. Look at what we call precision medicine is nothing precise. Because this is this show the failure of the medicine in the medical field. So in that sense, uh, we have to link our data bank to look at and to chance what the response of our patient while we give them medicine. And uh, with the kind of knowledge we are trying to create in the new Asian value is a clinical partnership and a practice-based research. So, in that sense, we argue that reflection on medical professionalism are essential for enacting bioethics guidelines and for applying new health technology in ways consistent with the transcultural justice. 
For ultimate purpose of developing a civil economy in the field of healthcare, so I think that it's not just in healthcare. Once people familiar the data, and the healthcare data is most sensitive to the people. Once they can share, then they can share their culture and family history. And even they can share the large scale environmental data. Those kinds of interactive platform will be very important for to think about what we're going to do and the forever learning environment building for big data age. So in that sense, we are thinking, it's all our mindset. Should we do it? We want to create a mentally healthy city and a community. For in the health city movement to promote comprehensive and systemic policy and planning for health, emphasize the need to address inequality in health and the urban poverty, also regional dis disparity. And the need for voluntary group, and we need a participatory governments. And the social, economic, and environmental determinants of health should be addressed in our, our collective effort. So next time, I think that we are going to have the collaborative office in Bangkok. And then we are looking for some opportunity here to learn from you. And here, we want to contribute a part of Taiwan to the region. And thank you for your listening. And this is my online course that you may take a look. And thank you for your attention. I feel it's a very in line with the transcultural justice and the Gotong Rayon community based development and community empowerment. We still have uh, seven minutes to 12 30 if any. Huh? 20 minutes. 10 minutes to 12 30 if any suggestions, any questions, and any please. Thank you. Thanks for the, those talks. I've got a, a couple of questions for Dujan Tsai. Um, that's very interesting. Um, my, I have two questions. Um, the first refers to the relationship between the technology and the moral values you're, um, you're um, intending to implement as a result of the technology. Um, I have no doubt that your intentions and indeed your outcomes are admirable. But is there an inherent um, is there an inherent value that's embedded within the technology itself? Um, clearly, you're applying the technology for a, a purpose that's closely linked to your own value formulations. Um, but what's to stop a new malign dictator? who takes power, whether it's in Washington DC or Taipei, um, who seeks to use the technology actually to enforce a new, even, um, e even um, more malign system of authoritarian control and domination. Um, is, there, is there a moral, um, a, a moral content to the technology itself? And the second question is about the relationship between the local communities that you're seeking to, uh, to develop and to nurture um, using these, the principles of cooperation, however you refer to it as Gotan Royang or in some other way, and the larger scale global economy. Uh, clearly the local economies don't exist in isolation and they need to articulate with the larger scale processes of globalisation which are subject, as we know, 
to the various distortions of the market, of neoliberalism, of the designs of the various regimes and so on. You give uh, the <laughs> <laughs> Any question that you want to... Well, well, yes, well, uh, thank you. I, I got the microphone. So thank you for the microphone. But I, I was really interested, but that, that links very much to Paul's question to Dujian as well. Because you were talking about adapting technological systems to the local needs. And to what extent do you have to interfere in the technology itself to make it morally uh, adaptive to the, to the aims that you have? It, it just draws on the question that that Paul was raising. So do we have to, do we need different technologies if you want to have them work in the direction of a civil economy, as you call it? And maybe you could explain a bit more for me what exactly it is that you mean by a civil economy as opposed to a market economy. Because I find that idea very interesting, but I'm not sure I really understand what you mean by the civil in civil economy. So just try to, to explain a bit more what, you, what you're doing. And now I'm going to hand the microphone to who? <laughs> yes, Bill. Thank you very much. Um, I want to ask DJ, I very much liked your new scheme of uh, the medical relationship. Um, you're probably aware that the, uh, the supercomputer, the AI, which used to be called Blue, which uh, was the one that uh, won the game of Go and Chess against the world champions, is being used for medical diagnosis now. And it every day it scans online the extra several thousand medical papers that are produced every day. It uh, is being used then to provide the up, most up-to-date database of clinical trials that we have, and also is being used for medical consultation, it's in trials, and it's usually able to suggest alternative treatments to patients. So this advance of AI, artificial intelligence systems, which eventually will be used for every sort of system, including economic modeling and forecasts, and uh, as well as uh, everything we do, uh, will of course challenge the human relationships that I think um, uh, Paul and Dick were also uh, alluding to. So how would you bring this into the relationship? Because in fact, the AI systems are already one person in the relationship and they gradually will be, in addition when we combine it with robotic surgery, which is widely used for distant communities, uh, and uh, it's better in some operations already than a human surgeon because they don't shake and they are uh, very precise. So uh, this seems to be part of it. it. I think it has the potential to give more time for human beings involved in consultation, consent, and other mechanisms in part of a relationship and leave the technical aspects to the uh, machines. Um, what do you think? Okay. That's a good uh, thank, you. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for a very interesting presentation. Um, I have two questions, in fact. The first question is to our, our good presenter from Indonesia. Um, you know, one of the earliest works on society a nation has been on Indonesia. If you look at the work of Benedict Anderson in the 1960s, if I remember, he came out with a book called Imagined Nation. You know, and that, that book um, uh, and the literature that has come after that has kind of um, moved the behavior or rather the, the academic discourse on nation work. And Indonesia was actually the, the, the case study. Uh, the reason is Indonesia being so diverse, uh, you know, from Sumatra right up to the Irian, you know, people look different, they speak different dialect, they have probably have different faith system. But to bring everybody together in a concept of nationhood is something which is very remarkable. Now, having said that, if you were to look at the history of modern Indonesia, you know, you have 
continuous conflict everywhere, right? From Aceh, from Maluku, from, you know, and you now you have in Jakarta, it's ethnic base, it is communal base and whatnot. So how do you actually reconcile this with the concept of Gotong Royong? Because we also have the Gotong Royong in Malaysia, but of course we have the Gotong Royong to clean up the drains and, you know, in our neighborhood and, uh, you know, school activities and whatnot. Uh, Gotong Royong as a concept of community building, it's not really developed. I would, I'd like to know your experience in Indonesia. Thank you. And to DJ, I, my question is similar to uh, what, uh, what Paul has mentioned to you about, uh, you know, individuals who, who actually, you know, spearhead you know, uh, leadership and all that and the use of technology. The, the, the only thing about when you talk about state leaders or people in power is they tend to be amoral, right, rather than being moral. Because it is not that they are not moral, it is because the system doesn't allow them to be moral, you know, because the idea of sovereignty, the idea of interest, all comes into play. So an immoral person tend to have amoral tendencies. So it's, it, it, like it, it is a generational question we have been debating. And I don't know, maybe Taiwan has a answer to that. Thank you. Respond. <laughs> thank, thank, thank you. Okay, all. I just inform them, don't ask me difficult questions. <laughs> okay, Ravi, I think that your question is very important. And I think that all technology, what we are using is for two purposes. First, to self reflect on each individual's limitation. And for a higher value, we wish that the kind of interactive technology where you have a chance to know deeply about the other. Could you, for everyone, while using the technology, have a chance to live, to recognize the difference within your mind? Everybody have to recognize you are living with your own differences. Then you can begin to learn how to tolerate the difference in outside world. I think that the image community has some kind of is similar uh, tone, right? So I think that, uh, so I think along the line, uh, there you ask a very important question, and uh, similar to uh, Rabi thinking about the way system can find people. I think that the AI is definitely a disappointment for democracy. But we can put it in different lens. The different lens, I think that if we should link into Paul's first questions, I think that how technology can be related to the person. I think that at the first place, there is no way for technology to intervene. We have to develop a service model, hand in hand, person in person, at the first place. Once the service model has been constructed, then which is the technology should follow our relationship and to expand it rather than dominate. So which is very important. But uh, most recently, I find the AI is also very, very powerful for emancipation purpose. For what? Because I listen to a lot of uh, computer software for qualitative data analysis. None of them are convincing to me. Because of why I'm doing the qualitative analysis, I am more keen to the narrative which is related to uh, temporal formation and uh, different contexts in terms, in terms of time and space. So the difficult part is that how we use computer software. The software tend to ignore the time differences. And uh, sometimes 
even in the normal, in the space differences, geographic differences. But the time difference has been eliminated is a serious problem. So I think that each individual, at a different layer of organization in the community, there is a very layer of narrative formation. So once there's a narrative formation out there, AI could be provide a solution to look at the three dimensions all together and sufficiently to identify the uniqueness of the humanity and the human, human as an intake in different layer of analysis. So that's a way that us people from civil society should work on. But definitely, we shouldn't let the authoritarian regime have a chance to intervene our relations. So uh, in that sense, we think that um, uh, the second question, I think that uh, the IT, in a sense, if we situate them into the service that we already in hand and then try to explore the variation when we are expanding by using disseminating knowledge and practice by using the system. I think it's very important that the difference we will be delightful to finding and identify various kind of differences along the line. And then there's the various layer of the division of labor. For example, uh, why we work why we work with a, a low economic status community in Taipei City which is in slum area. Then they got uh, the technology and they got a wonderful community mobilization plan. And then we led that community to sell their business model to other communities. And we are supporting to them. Then step by step, we were each, the, each time the business model get an opportunity we step, we take one step backward rather than forward. So in that sense, we think that the people will have a chance, the community will have a chance to lead a large scale of information. In that sense, we think that if we build a civil society across the nation, media to the mighty the professional in the area, which might be another way that we can couple with uh, large scale global discourse. I think that the Donald Trump, the president of Philippines, even the mayor of Taipei are people of the same feather. But we are thinking that we are so, we are lose of hope. So we select them as our leader. But if we can be well known and be, can be capable a little bit, we might have a second choice. So which is my answer. Thank you very much. And then Professor Sriyagi Tantan. Thank you. Well, actually, the essence of so-called economic ethics is economic justice, economic mutualism, and economic brotherhood. This is the basic of what we mean with ethics. We can ask why, all of a sudden, we have European community. They are diverse. They are so diverse. So many countries. Right after the fall of the Great War, 1989, November 9, so not 9-11, but 11-9, Remember that? The fall of Berlin Wall is not 9-11, 11-9. When the Britain Wall fall, fell, then they get together in Berlin. And I said, Beethoven, the Ninth Symphony was performed. And the fourth movement said, from Schiller, Gustav Schiller, 
and the mentioned we are the builder. All men are brothers. Then they unite. Why? There must be a certain commonality. There must be a certain mutuality. Common purpose. Common needs. What I call mutual needs. Then we have to ask them why. All of a sudden that British exits. Also Indonesia. We have so many ethnic groups. So large. This from Berlin, if some from London to Moscow, from Moscow to Egypt. This Indonesia, only one nation. There must be a strong power to get them together, and that's why Indonesia created Pancasila. Back in 1932, there is a young man fighting in Europe. And later, he became the proclaimer of the independence. The name was Nata. He said, if Indonesia get together in 1932, when Indonesia will get together, we must have a real unity. A real unity means a real feeling of brotherhood. We become one. If there is no mutual feeling or mutual brotherhood or things like that, Then what happen is not persatuan, persatuan mean unity. But what happen is persatuan. Then the Indonesian will understand. Jika kita bersatu, harus ada rasa bersama. Kalau tidak ada rasa bersama, maka yang ada bukan persatuan, tetapi persatuan. You know, sate is. <laughs> Dijadikan satu. So, Indonesia create that kind of mutuality, the Pancasila. We are different, each other, but we are the same. When you open here, there's red and white, and this is Pancasila. This is the five principle of Indonesian uh, basic values, as I mentioned in the first page. So, to create a strong cohesion, we have to practice Pancasila. Then, sometimes I have to say, to destroy Indonesia is very easy. To destroy Indonesia, just destroy Pancasila like now. There's a problem now in Indonesia. Look at the Irian, the Papuas, and many others, the Ajay. So, there ought to be a political will together. That's why, when Pancasila is lacking right like now, We feel that we are different, and sometimes in, 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 in many other discussion, especially in Gajah Mada University here, that Pancasila is considered to be Indonesian existentialism. We thought Pancasila Indonesia does not exist. We thought something that European will not exist, European Union will not exist. I don't know why. I don't know what. What make Europe together? But I know what makes Indonesia together. Nah, and then again, uh, there is a question by Arif Hussein from Bangladesh. Uh, I like to say it from a economic point of view. There are a lot of poverty here, so the basic needs become really very important. The government should make available the basic need of the people. Right, but then, but it is not enough. Not only that the government should make available the basic need of the people, but I continue further. That the basic needs, the people should be the producer of the basic needs, meaning employment. And employment is in this constitution. That's why. Uh, In the beginning of the constitution, they say, on page one, on page, yeah, on page two, the constitution say, every citizen shall have the right to employment and to a decent living as human being. Decent living as human being. So the United Nations just say, pro job and pro poor. 
In 2000, in year 2000, Indonesia already said that in 1945, pro job and pro poor. It is not sufficient just only the government provide the basic needs of the people, but the people should be the producers of the basic needs, employment. When we have a common purpose, com kind of commonality, then we will survive as a nation. And fortunately, when Indonesia got more and more modern, when the traffic is much better, then it's no longer a problem that the Japanese in Java, you know, there is a kind of marriage, intermarriage between Javanese and non-Javanese. I don't know, Lukman, you come from Palembang, what's your wife is? Surabaya. Surabaya. Yeah, the wife is from Surabaya. When I got married 50 years ago, no, 40, 43 years ago, <laughs> when I got married 30 years ago, you know, people in Java said to us, ha, you married a son, Sumatranese? But now there is no problem like that. In their marriage, it's become, become ordinary. And then it strengthens Indonesia too. But most important is we have to create common enemy. And for Indonesia now, for me, our common enemy is poverty. Our company is unemployment. Then it becomes a common, uh, common purpose of Indonesia. Then we will be together. Indonesia now, right now, face any problem. Ethnic matter, uh, ethics matter. I don't know. Is there any word of ethic matter? We have a crisis of crisis of leadership. We have a constitutional crisis. And we have a moral crisis. When you let rich people like Indonesia, but a huge poverty like this, this is immoral. In the same time, this crisis of leadership, and the same time also crisis of constitution. Thank you, sir. Madam. Thank you very much, sir. We, the time very fast is already. <laughs> and we have uh, until 12.30, but now it's already 12.45, and we can discuss later in the, after the sessions. We should appreciate to two great speaker, Professor Sri Edis Vasona and Professor Tsai. Thank you very much. Yeah. And you, we start this for this time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Vijay. Thank you very much for all the panelists and moderator. And then we would like to invite all the panelists and moderator to stand up for a moment, as there will be souvenir presented by Professor Lukman Hakim. Please, for all the panelists and also moderator, and please, Professor Lukman Hakim, to present the souvenir for the panelists and moderator. Thank you very much. Give applause for all the panelists and the moderator. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, before we go on a break session, 
There are some information that will be presented on ABA general meeting and presentation for upcoming ABC 18 in Korea. So please stay here and please for the representative of ABA call deliver the information. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much, everybody. My name is Daryl Mesa, the Secretary of the Asian Biophysics Association. And my name is Miyako Takagi. Um, I'm a president of the Asian Biophysics Association. Thank you. And could we ask, uh, Miyako is going to ask all the members to please stand up and uh, uh, introduce yourself, all the uh, board members of the Asian Biophysics Association. Please uh, introduce yourself using a microphone. Good afternoon, Young Mogu from South Korea, Vice President for South Korea. Thank you. Arena Pollard from Australia, Vice President of the Pacific. Dr. Selva Nayagam from India, Vice President for India. Uh, Professor Shamima Lashkar, uh, Vice President Southeast Asia. Umar Angarayeni, Vice President for Indonesia. Uh, Ravi Chandran Murthy, uh, VP Southeast Asia. Sui uh, Jani from Taiwan. Tsuyoshi Aoya, Japan, Vice President of ABC. ABA. ABA. Japan. 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 Okay, thank you very much. So that's uh, our board members. Uh, apologies from uh, several members who are not here. Um, I'm going to show you what happened to the website. Okay, so please. Uh, okay, thank you. So, uh, Miyako and I will introduce the Asian Biofix Association. This is a, we have an annual meeting every year. And uh, the website is shown here. Uh, and this is a conference that you know very much about because we are very grateful uh, to the uh, local hosts. And I think we'd like to uh, applaud the local organizers for holding a, such an excellent conference 